Hi everyone, and welcome to an additional virtual chemistry lesson. Today I thought I'd talk about the relative strength of reduction and oxidation agents, uh, or uh, something that is usually referred to as uh, the electrochemical series as well. Uh, so we're going to go into that. For those of you who are new to this, uh, this is a video for the Swedish Chemistry 1 course. Uh, and in this video, I will assume that you know the definitions of reduction and oxidation, as well as the concept of oxidation numbers. So make sure you know that before you dwell deeper into this. But let's go. Uh, the picture that we had on the front, we also have here on the second slide. It's a picture of a beaker wherein we put copper wire in silver nitrate solution and then left it for like about a day. Then the following happens. You see this gray, uh, almost fussy stuff being formed and the solution that was, would you don't see it on this picture, but it started off as a nice transparent solution, now has turned and clear, now it's turned blue. So it started off as a colorless solution and now it's blue. So this uh, fussy stuff, that silver being formed on the surface, which we could determine through chemical analysis if we wanted to, and the solution turns blue. So, what happens when we put copper wire in silver nitrate solution? Well, we'll get back to this at the end of the lesson. Hopefully you'll be able to answer the question then. So, let's start off with a question, another one. So, we talked a little bit about reactive uh, reactivity, reactive substances of various types. Uh, and then maybe it makes sense to think that the more reactive a substance, or for example an element is, the better reducing slash oxidation agent it is, right? So we're going to look into this a little bit. This we've talked about before, uh, or I've talked about it in my chemistry class. Uh, we have general trends of reactivity for elements. You should know that metals and non-metals react in the opposite way. In chemical reactions, metals donate electrons, whereas non-metals uh, take up or steal or accept electrons from something else. In some cases, they share between each other as well. Then we call it covalent bonding and we form molecules. But because the process is opposite, the general trends of reactivity between metals, shown in grey here, and non-metals, shown in a uh, gold yellowish U here, uh, they're going to be different. So the further to the left we go and the further to the down in the periodic table we go, we're going to see a general trend of increased reactivity. So the most reactive metals would be the alkali metals in the very bottom here. They have huge atomic radii. The nucleus is very far from the outermost electron meaning that it can't pull very hard on that electron. So therefore it's very easy for them to get rid of it and therefore donate it. It's also reflected by the electronegativity values here. The smaller value, the more reactive. Because electronegativity is a measure of how strongly uh, the element will attract electrons. For non-metals, since they react by taking up electrons, the Elements with the highest value of electronegativity will be the more reactive ones. And then we will find high electronegativity values in the elements that have a small atomic radii, a few uh, valence shells with electrons being in the way from the nucleus when it attracts electrons from other atoms. So fluorine here will be the most, uh, most reactive non-metal. So far up to the right and yeah, up and right for non-metals, the opposite for metals. And this is fairly uh, nicely shown if you, for example, drop a piece of lithium in a beaker next to a piece of uh, sodium in another beaker. You will see that sodium is way more reactive than lithium. And potassium will be even more reactive. It burns with a nice purple flame almost immediately and burns up really quick. Uh, it's a fairly dangerous experiment, so don't try that at home. So. So electronegativity values can give us a good idea of how reactive metals and non-metals are. 
However, when we talk about electrochemistry, which is the field we're getting into at the moment, we talk about electrochemical series instead. What I'm going to talk about, the relative strength of reducing and oxidation agents, or oxidizing agents, therefore the electrochemical series, it's not the same as directly translatable to how reactive elements are. So the, how, uh, the relative reactivity of elements could be put in a reactivity series. For example, you can make a reactivity series with metals, where you put the most reactive metals at one end and the least reactive metals at another end, and you get a relative scale. If you were to look at the same metals in an electrochemical series, you would not have the same order. Hmm. So, when we talk about how reactive metals are, that's related to how fast the reaction takes place, how violent the reaction is, right? And this is related to something called kinetics. And if you study more chemistry in the future, uh, for example, the Swedish Chemistry 2 course, or if you study IB chemistry, then you'll study more about kinetics and get into how kinetics work. Uh, but for now, we say if it reacts fast and violently, then it's reactive. But the electrochemical series, that's related to how energetically favorable a reaction is. And this is based on thermodynamics. Uh, the discussion is more of one of how stable elements are after they've been reacting and before they react. So we will get similar series, but not exactly the same. And I'm going to try and show you a little bit what I mean by this. So. I'm going to pick out a few metals here, and then I'm going to present them. Uh, there's going to be uh, mainly, or it's only going to be alkali metals and alkaline earth metals. And I just picked out a few, looked at their relative reactivity. So here I have some metals. We have potassium, sodium, lithium, barium, strontium, and calcium. And if we look how reactive these are, how fast they react, potassium will be the most reactive, then sodium, then lithium, and so on. For example, this could be easily demonstrated by dropping them in acid or dropping them in water. Potassium would have the most violent and fast reaction, and calcium would have the least violent and slowest reaction. And this follows the trends of electronegativity. If we were to talk about the electrochemical series, what we're going to talk about here, then we would have the same metals but in a different order. So what are they sorted by? Well, they're sorted by their tendency to become oxidized. And this is related to how stable the products they form will be. So lithium will have the strongest tendency to oxidize, then potassium, then barium, then strontium. You see this isn't following a clear trend of the same way here. So I would like you to note that even though re some reactions are more violent and happen way faster, that does not always correspond to them being more energetically favorable. That doesn't mean that they form more stable products after the chemical reaction. Uh, we can have slower reactions. For example, when lithium reacts, that will form that will be way slower than potassium, but it will form a more energetically stable product. This is what we're going to talk about here. We're going to compare elements tendency to become oxidized metals and then we're going to look a little bit about some non-metals and their tendency to become reduced as well. And that's related to how much how stable the products will be. So you know that metals react through oxidation they will therefore uh, hold on okay there we go. So metals react through oxidation. For example, magnesium, when it reacts, it will oxidize, therefore losing electrons and form magnesium ions like this. Some metals have a stronger tendency to oxidize than others, and therefore also it will remain oxidized and will be more content, you could almost say, than other metals. It's a relative scale here. Uh, and we can construct a relative scale of how much various types of metals want to be oxidized or how strong reducing agents they are because these terms go hand in hand the more the metal wants to oxidize and the more stable product it forms 
the stronger it will be as a reducing agent, the more likely it is to force something else to reduce. And this scale that we're going to go through today, and these, this uh, relative scale between various types of metals, it's determined through experiments, of course, as many things are in chemistry. So I'm going to go through how we could determine the relative tendency to become oxidized or the relative strength as a reducing agent through a chemical experiment. So for our experiment, and I'm just going to do this uh, uh, theoretically, as, uh, as we say, so it's a theoretical experiment, but you could do this if you have the materials at hand. Uh, I'm isolated at the moment, so I'm not uh, at school. It's uh, 2020 and in the corona crisis, so I'm making this theoretical, but this is definitely something you could do in school. So take out some small pieces of magnesium, iron and copper. This could be sheet metal or, for example, ribbons of these metals. Then you take out some salts, you take up the sulfate salts of the metals we have here. So magnesium sulfate, iron sulfate, iron 2 sulfate, and copper 2 sulfate. And we take these uh, oxidation states of iron and copper, so we have only plus 2 ions here, so everything is comparable and nice. Uh, you take out some distilled water and some beakers as well, and then we're going to combine these things. So. So we combine the metals with aqueous solutions of the salts. So for example, you take some iron sulfate and you dilute it in water. Then you put a magnesium ribbon down into it and you leave it there. We could also put a piece of magnesium in copper sulfate solution. Putting magnesium in magnesium sulfate doesn't seem to make any sense. It's just, it's not going to happen anything. Um, so we're not going to do that, we're just going to combine them with different types of solutions here. We can put some iron in magnesium sulfate, and we can put some iron in copper sulfate here. You can notice that I've tried to mimic the colors that these solutions will have. Iron sulfate will have a blue-green color in solution because of the iron 2 ions. Copper sulfate, it will have a blue color and magnesium sulfate, that's a transparent solution. So we put some magnesium in two different solutions, we put some iron in two different solutions, then we'll put some copper in the iron sulfate solution and the magnesium sulfate solution. And then you, and then you can leave it like this. You could, for example, put the piece of metal at the bottom of the flask, and you leave it like this for, let's say you look at, at what happened the day after the experiment. So you leave it for 24 hours and then you come back and see what happens. So wait a day and we see what happens and then we'll see the following. In this beaker, the metal will be coated with iron and the solution will have lost its color. Interesting. In the second beaker, the magnesium will be coated with copper and again, the color has been lost from the solution. If we put, if we look at this beaker, there's no change. There's no coating of metal or anything on the iron here, and uh, the same color of solution. When we put iron in copper sulfate solution, the iron will be coated with copper, and the solution will slowly lose its color. Dependent, of course, on the concentrations you've mixed this in and how much metal you have available. But if you have more metal than you have uh, uh, copper sulfate, then this will lose color over time. Copper put in iron sulfate solution results in no change, nor copper put in magnesium sulfate solution here. So this is what your results will be. What does this tell us? Well, let's sum them up in a table. So the combinations of metals and solutions of various sulfate salts that caused a redox reaction. So magnesium, it's going to react, and therefore in this case it's a redox context, so it's oxidized in the following solutions. Iron sulfate and copper sulfate. Iron, it's only changed and therefore undergone oxidation of some sort in a copper sulfate solution, and the copper didn't oxidize in any of the solutions here. Hmm, interesting. 
and I'm gonna go back here a little bit. Um, so why these solutions lost color? It's because the ions that gave them the color, for example, iron ions gave it this solution a nice color. They're gone. They've been replaced with magnesium ions instead. That's why we have iron here. In this solution we lost color because copper ions that give the blue color, they've formed solid copper on here. And magnesium has replaced the copper in here. Same here. The copper that gave the color here uh, have gone here. And then this loses color as well. And then may actually it will turn a little bit green because of the iron ions. So that's on me. <laughs> So, we can say like this, that when we combine magnesium with various uh, salts of metals, magnesium will be oxidized in most of the cases. Then iron will be oxidized in fewer cases, and then copper will be oxidized in even fewer examples. Of course, you could expand this to include, include more metals and co to compare the relative uh, oxidation tendency of them. For a simple experiment, let's just take three elements and their corresponding ions in solution. So, now we have a sort of relative series here. Magnesium has a stronger tendency to be oxidized than iron. Iron has a stronger tendency to oxidize than copper and so on. If we have this and this knowledge, then we can know quite a bit about the relationship between these. I mean, this is just a quick experiment. And uh, lots of people had done various types of way more complicated experiments. And we can take experimental data uh, and we can summarize it in a electrochemical series. So here you have a list of various types of metals. And then we can have a nice arrow like this to show the relative tendency to become oxidized. The further to the left on this scale, the stronger the tendency to become oxidized. Therefore, the further to the left, the stronger the metal's reducing ability is. So it will be a stronger reducing agent the further to the left we are on this scale. We can add some more information. These elements here, these are um, alkali metal, uh, me sorry, alkali metals and alkaline earth metals. These will displace Hydrogen gas, they will form hydrogen gas if we combine them with the water, steam, and acids. These uh, elements, they will uh, form hydrogen gas in steam, so hot water, and acids as well. These metals here, they will react with only acids, so water won't do it, but if they react with acids, they will form hydrogen gas. And these metals here, they will not form hydrogen gas when combined with acids or steam or anything like that. And maybe you can see something interesting here. You see a element here that's not a metal. Hydrogen is included here as well. So why is hydrogen included? Well, it's included to separate the metals that actually can react with acids to form hydrogen gas and the metals that do not. It's also included because of something that's called standard electrode potentials. It's related to batteries, we could say. Uh, it will there act as a reference, but we will get into that in a later video. So for now, you can think of the following that all metals to the left of hydrogen here, they will react with acids to form hydrogen gas. And all metals to the right of hydrogen here, they will not. That means that these metals, they're resistant to oxidation, and then we call them noble. You can recognize, for example, gold and platinum and silver and copper here, noble metals. And in order to dissolve these, we need the stronger stuff. So that's why we call them noble, they're resistant to reaction, reacting. And these are not then noble gases, but the noble means the same, that they're resistant to reactions. They are unlikely to react, we can say. Okay, interesting. So I told you that metals left of hydrogen in series will react with acids to form hydrogen gas. Let's quickly look at the reaction between magnesium and hydrochloric acid. 
you write the equation, you balance it, you write states of matter where it's prudent. And this is something we've practiced before. You can assign, uh, assign oxidation numbers here. Elements in their natural state will have zero. Hydrogen in compounds have plus one. Chlorine will have minus one in that case because the total sum of oxidation numbers for a compound will be its charge. No charge in total, so the sum of these have to add up to zero. Magnesium has the oxidation number of plus two because it's an ion. Uh, magnesium ions, you know the charge of based on the periodic table. The same goes for chloride ions. Each of them will have minus one and then we have two of them, so the total charge will be zero. Hydrogen gas is hydrogen in its elemental form, so that will have the oxidation number of zero here again. If you look at the oxidation numbers, magnesium will go from zero to plus two. It increases in oxidation number, which corresponds to an oxidation. And hydrogen is reduced because its oxidation number goes from plus one to zero. That's a decrease in oxidation number, and that's a reduction. So all metals that are left of hydrogen in the electrochemical series introduced on the previous slide will react with hydrochloric acid this way. That's why we say they oxidize in presence of something that can donate hydrogen. <clears throat> so what is this good for? Well, we can use our electrochemical series first and foremost to start predicting a little bit. We can make predictions about which redox reactions will be spontaneous, that is happen on their own, and which will not. So here we have two reactions, and the question is which one of them will be spontaneous? So in the first reaction we have manganese that reacts with a solution of lead sulfate to form manganese sulfate and solid lead metal. Or vice versa, if we put solid lead metal in magnesium sulfate, then if man manganese is formed and you uh, get the lead sulfate in solution, that's a different type of reaction. One of these will happen spontaneously, one will not. Hmm. So, first and foremost, we need to determine what's oxidized and what is reduced. If you look at this first reaction here, manganese reacts with uh, lead sulfate to form manganese sulfate and lead. Well, manganese then turns from elemental form to positive ions in manganese sulfate here. So this will be the oxidation half equation that I've written over here. It oxidizes in this reaction. Lead, on the other hand, it turns from ions to solid lead metal. Then it needs to take up extra electrons to form solid lead. Okay. In the second, uh, right, sorry. And sulfate, you see it's here before the reaction, and it's exactly the same afterwards. Then we call it a spectator ion. An ion that just follows in the reaction but doesn't react. It's the same before and after the arrow. And then we can make an arrow like this to show that two electrons are donated from this metal to these ions here. And that's what this uh, arrow will indicate later as well. Okay, in this reaction it's the opposite, then it's lead being oxidized and donates electrons to form lead ions in this lead sulfate. Manganese ions take up electrons to form solid manganese. And sulfate is still the spectator ion. Two electrons are transferred from lead to manganese. So, now we know a little bit about these two reactions. We know what's oxidized and what's reduced in both of them. Now we can look at the electrochemical series as well to draw some conclusions. Because this will not happen. Only reaction one will happen, and I'll try to explain why. So, so I've just summarized the two equations up here, and here we have the electrochemical series. If you see, manganese is further to the left in this series than lead. That means that manganese will have a stronger tendency to oxidize, or to become oxidized, and remain oxidized, than lead has the tendency to oxidize and remain oxidized. Therefore, 
The likely scenario is the one where manganese will oxidize at the expense of lead. Remember that both metals want to be ions, because when they're ions, they're closer to a noble gas configuration. But in this case, manganese is stronger. It has a stronger tendency to oxidize than lead, so it will force lead to turn back to its metal form, uh, and it itself forms positive 2 plus ions. Because it has a stronger tendency to do this, therefore it forces lead to go back. Uh, we can, therefore, we can use this uh, electrochemical series to compare uh, the relative tendency of metals to react. So, let's summarize. The electrochemical series is a series that lets us see which metal is more likely to be oxidized and remain oxidized, and this can happen at the expense of another metal, so we'll see which one is the strongest. We could also construct a non-metal electrochemical series. Uh, the non-metals, they tend to gain electrons in reactions instead, they become reduced. And we can sort them by their tendency to do so. We can make a very simple one based on the halogens because they're straightforward. Uh, and if we do that and we compare them, we'll find that fluorine gas has the strongest tendency to become reduced, followed by chlorine gas, bromine gas, and iodine gas. So these follow the reactivity trends as well. Fluorine is the furthest up in the periodic table, then chlorine, bromine, and iodine here. And actually, fluorine is a fluorine is an extremely good oxidizing agent as well, or yeah, oxidizing agent. So we could then use this small scale to do similar uh, conclusion, draw similar conclusions that we did before. So we can predict other types of spontaneous reactions. For example, the reaction between chlorine gas, oh, sorry, uh, no, chlorine in solution with sodium iodine in solution that may form sodium chloride and iodine, or iodine may react with sodium chloride to form chlorine and sodium iodine, or sodium iodide, sorry. So which one of these is likely to happen? Uh, you could pause the video and think about this on your own if you'd like, uh, but I'm gonna go through it now, just to, so we get somewhere. The trick here is to look at the oxidation numbers. Elements in their natural state has zero. Ions will have the same oxidation number as their charge. And then element again. And then we can do the same thing for the second reaction here. So, we know that fluorine has a stronger tendency to become reduced than chlorine, which has a stronger tendency to become reduced than bromine and then iodine. So chlorine here is further to the left than iodine. So the reaction that is likely is the one where chlorine is reduced. So the reaction that is likely to happen is the reaction where chlorine takes up extra electrons. So does that happen in any one of these? Well, in the first reaction we have chlorine that uh, decreases in oxidation number that corresponds to a reduction, which is what is likely. Chlorine can become reduced at the expense of iodine. So that happens in reaction 1 here. Uh, in reaction 2, iodine becomes reduced at the expense of chlorine, or chloride here. That doesn't happen because chloride is happy as an ion, uh, and it will remain so, and iodine can force it to change back because it has a stronger reduce, uh, tendency to be, be reduced. So, since chlorine is reduced in reaction 1, it fits well with the series below, therefore we know that this is a spontaneous reaction. This will happen, but if we mix iodine and sodium chloride, th uh, this won't happen. So that's how we can use this small series in a similar way as the electrochemical series for the metals. Uh, these examples I've shown you now 
both in the experiment and uh, in the equa uh, chemical equations, they're examples of single displacement reactions. In a single displacement reaction, a element replaces another element in a compound, like this. A will replace B in a compound, so we get B as an element and we get A, C as a compound, like this. For example here, in the, when we had manganese reacting with the lead sulfate, the manganese and the lead switched places, so that manganese turned into ions and lead turned into element again. And the example we will have a chlorine mixed with sodium iodine, the same thing will happen as well. Uh, chlorine and iodine, they switch places here. One becomes the ion and the other becomes the element. So they displace each other and there's only one thing here in this uh, compound that displaces, so we say it's a single displacement reaction. All right, now we've gone through quite a bit. So let's, let's go back to the first example with copper wire and silver nitrate solution. Now I'd like you to pause the video, use all of your knowledge obtained in this video to explain the following two things. Why silver is formed on the copper, and why the solution turns blue. So pause the video, and then I will finalize the video by going through this as well. The answer to this is copper is further to the left on the electrochemical series, therefore it has a stronger tendency to become oxidized and turned into ions. It will force silver ions back into the metallic state. Uh, the silver ions are in the solution, and they're forced back by the copper that give them electrons. Uh, copper turns then into nice ions in solution. Silver is formed as a solid metal on the surface of the copper. Copper ions, copper 2 plus ions, they're blue in solution. They form blue a blue complex together with water, which means that that's why we have the blue color. So it's an indication that this solution here is rich in copper ions, and then we get solid silver formed here. That's the answer. So I hope you learned something by my uh, hastily concocted video. Um, and uh, I will see you in another video where we will use these concepts to try and explain how batteries work. But for now, I'll thank you for your attention, and I'll see you in the next one.